Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you have any questions for our guests, there are many ways you can contact the show. You can post a question on our wall on Facebook, Skype us, send us a tweet on Twitter to at The Organic View, or you can contact me directly at June Stoyer. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today, I'll be speaking to Lois Dieterle in regards to her book, Sinfully Vegan. Vegan dishes and desserts have come a very long way. Thanks to cooking shows, the Internet, and skilled chefs that have shared their recipes, more and more people can enjoy eating delectable desserts that are not only gluten-free, but are free from animal-based ingredients. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, heart disease is still the number one cause of death in the United States. Obesity has also been a major health concern. Even the First Lady, Michelle Obama, has various initiatives in order to help people make better food choices. The bottom line is that people need to look at the foods that they are consuming, especially when it comes to desserts, which are often rich in fats, additives, and preservatives. Eating desserts is not always a bad thing. What matters is the kind of desserts and, more importantly, what ingredients they are made with. Anyone who maintains good health knows that all foods should be consumed in moderation. In the book Sinfully Vegan, Lois Dieterle has assembled quite a collection of amazing desserts that is sure to please even the toughest food critic. And considering the fact that I taught culinary arts for 12 years and I could literally make a feast out of ketchup packets, Let me tell you something. The recipes that Lois has in this book are really, really phenomenal. And pretty much there is something in there that is going to please even the toughest person. And the thing is is that if you didn't know that that the recipe was a vegan recipe, you would just enjoy it. And it's almost like an afterthought, like, oh, wow, you know, that's vegan. Lois also offers a great explanation of what the key ingredients are used for and why. So if you're someone that loves desserts but wants to cut out the animal-based products or wants to be able to enjoy gluten-free desserts or simply wants to try something new, this is definitely a book that you need to explore. The recipes are very easy to make. They're also kid-friendly, and they are not terribly expensive to make whatsoever. That was one of the key things when it comes to some of these recipes because you could spend an arm and a leg on many of the recipes that are out there, but this book has quite an assortment of different types of recipes that, as I said, are kid-friendly and very easy to make. So I'd like to welcome to the show Lois Dieterle. Good afternoon, Lois, and welcome to The Organic View. Hi, thank you. Lois, can you tell our audience about yourself and especially about your culinary background? I am a school teacher, and I got interested in cooking from, I guess, from my mother, who was a home ec teacher, and she allowed me to fool around in the kitchen from the time I was very young. I think I do mention that in the book. My first memory is of making what I call chocolate pudding. I have no idea what was in it, but I was about four years old, just kind of goofing around the kitchen. So I was never afraid to fool around with recipes. So when I became vegan, which was about 15 years ago, I... um, really miss desserts. I do have a sweet tooth, and I decided to play around with recipes. So I am not formally trained whatsoever. These recipes are written for just the average person who wants to have some comfort food, who wants to eat a little healthier, or they are vegan and looking for something to eat as a dessert. That's that's what they're geared to. It's just my experiences, what worked, what didn't work, so I could share my experiences with other people. One of the toughest things that I found when you're trying to make desserts especially that taste not only taste good but are vegan is the ingredients i mean you have a lot of very interesting substitutions here can you explain how you came out with the options that you provided as far as different things to substitute cream cheese for example or if you are using a particular type of milk product why you chose the substitutions that you did The cream cheese, for example, that I chose, I tried several different kinds, and there are many different products, and I do name, if I find a product that I think works well in a recipe, I will name it by brand name because some are better than others, so I did try them 
by taste. So that's how I came out with those. The different milks that I chose, there are all sorts of different vegan options for milks. And my personal favorite is almond milk just because I like the thickness of it, the um, the flavoring of it. But, again, as I mentioned in the book, try um, all different kinds of options. If you're not happy with one, um, try a different kind. But um, that was trial and error, and I try to talk about my experiences to help people who are just trying this for the first time so that uh, maybe they won't um, make some of the, I don't want to say mistakes, but some of the, um, recipes that aren't quite what they would like them like I did. Yeah, I, I found the same thing uh, when I was trying to experiment. I mean, when I made the transition, I had no idea how valuable avocados are. I used to think that avocado, avocados were just for salads or for guacamole. Uh, I didn't really have any understanding that they are such a useful fruit. And the thing is, is that you have so many recipes in here that utilize avocados, and it's just unbelievable. I mean, uh, for example, with the banana cannoli recipe, and especially, you know, in New York, cannolis are a very big thing. For those of you that have no idea what a cannoli is, um, it's, it's a very uh, traditional Italian pastry that is made uh, usually with, um, sometimes they'll make it with ricotta uh, cheese and basically sugar, some nuts, and um, chocolate chips, and then they put it in a shell. Um, it, it's like a tubular shell, and it's, it's a staple when it comes to uh, Italian desserts. If you go to Ferrara's in Little Italy or any major... Italian restaurant, they usually serve them for desserts, or as a dessert, rather. And you came up with this banana cannoli, and just looking at the recipe in the book, all I thought to myself was, wow, that was clever. Um, I was playing around with avocados the one day, making, I love guacamole, so I was playing with that, and my (laughs) son-in-law likes it very um, uh, whipped, where I like it lumpy. Well, I was whipping it, thinking, wow, this would make the best base for a cream and so that's where that came from where I started playing with it and it makes an awesome whipped cream now um, I use the chocolate in it so that it has chocolate has a heavy flavor to um, um, so it tastes like a, a cream and it was I was just so impressed with it that that was just such fun that was a neat discovery so I was excited about that one <laughs> and also I noticed um, especially with this particular recipe, you even specify to use four medium-sized ripe, and it says in parentheses, yellow with black spots, bananas. Yes. Most people, and this is something that really, I, I never will understand this, especially with the students that I taught for so many years, they will look a bit at a banana, and if the banana has a brown spot on it, they will say, oh, that's rotten, and yeah. they'll they'll throw it out. Meanwhile, the more ripe a banana is, the more sugar is produced by, you know, the more natural sugar that there is in the banana. And I thought that that was very smart to do that. Right. I try to give directions in this cookbook so that anybody can use it. I know I've been frustrated um, by some cookbooks that I've gotten in the past that will tell you, um, for example, I was trying to make pumpkin pie when I first started um, cooking on my own from a real pumpkin. They said use two cups of real cooked pumpkin, but how do I get the pumpkin out of the pumpkin and into two cups? They don't tell you. They assume you know. So I tried to make notes like that so anybody can use this book. Um, So some people might assume a banana is a banana, whether it's green or brown or whatever. So I tried to put little hints in like that. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that when you hear people talk about recipes, especially if you have no idea what you're doing. And when I first made the transition to a plant-based diet, people would talk about certain products, and I had no idea what they were talking about. And it's just interesting that the references that are out there, they're also very vague, but you actually take the time and go through the trouble of explaining these things, which I thought was really very helpful to not only any adult that picks up this book, but to children as well. Because there's a big, big change that is going on, especially in the teenage and tween age community, where young people are starting to 
look at the way that our food produ- is produced, and they're saying, you know something, I do not want to contribute to what's going on with animals. Or, or from just a dietary perspective, they don't want to expose themselves to the potential for having heart disease or any other diseases that are basically caused by consuming animal products. What it boils down to is that when you consume animal products, it's not healthy. Correct. And I just I think just all the additives and everything else that's in the food, it's it's um, just becoming quite an issue that I'm trying to reach children with. Being a teacher, that is one of the, the things that I'm trying to do. Um, I know several friends who have compromised immune systems now, and I think because we're so bombarded with so many things that we eat that some people's immune systems just get overloaded. So I think it's important, very important, to back off of that and, and try to eat a lot healthier. So I do try to reach a younger audience or people that maybe would not have cooked on their own before, you know, or just starting to cook. And it's, it can be a daunting task, so I try to explain um, to help them out. When you prepare any of these desserts and you're going to someone's home, do you often announce what it is that you've made? I take it at this point everybody in your family knows that you're vegan as well as your closest friends, but how do you present a new dish? Do you tell them ahead of time, by the way, this is vegan or what do you exactly do? Because I know that with me, many of my colleagues that know I'm a vegan, they're, they're expecting me to bring something, some type of tofu creation or some type of something that's going to involve granola or bean sprouts or something of the sort. When they see it, they're like, wow. I remember last year I had a big luncheon and I brought an organic avocado tapenade to die for. It was one of the first things that went as far as the buffet was concerned, and everybody was ranting and raving about it. And actually, Uncle Matt's Organics, the CEO, sent me a case of avocados, and these avocados were gigantic. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, June, my wife is looking to make this transition. Can you work with these avocados and see what you could come up with? And I said, sure. And I had a lot of fun. The avocado tapenade was just so easy. You just basically mash up an avocado add some organic garlic powder, some paprika, and I have, uh, I, I grow two different types of parsley, so I just garnished it with the parsley, and then, you know, you could use whatever crackers that you want, or you can use vegetables. It's absolutely delicious, mm-hmm. and it's it literally takes you five minutes to make. Sounds- it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. Sounds delicious. It, it really is. And I was very grateful for the opportunity, but with you, when you set out to write this book, And I'm sure that the recipes, a lot of these recipes that you have in here, these are things that you've been making for a very long time. But for some of the recipes, how many times did it take you to perfect the recipe? (laughs) Some of them I got right away, and others I probably, I don't know, five, six, seven times till I got it the way I liked it because it wasn't quite right, and I just wanted to tweak it just a little bit. So some of them would take a little bit. Um, But, yes, a lot of them are... Recipes that I grew up with are the comfort foods, and I talked about those. I grew grew up in a Pennsylvania German home, so yes, there's a lot of Pennsylvania German things in there, funny cake and and Moravian sugar cake and that type of thing. But then some of the newer ones are almost uh, the raw foods line along that, Tex-Mex kind of thing, um, some of the kid-friendly foods, so they were a lot different. So trying to get something for everyone in there. Yeah, and one of the things that I also noticed is you have quite a variety. Your section on Boston cream pie, I would never think to even attempt it. Mm -hmm. There are just so many recipes. I mean, I'm fairly new in the game when it comes to, I guess, more popular vegan main dishes and desserts even, because the thing is, is that I tend to make what I like, and I'm not looking to please anybody. I look at it this way. In America, we have this understanding that breakfast is supposed to consist of pancakes, waffles, bacon and eggs, or toast and jam, something like that. And the thing is, is that for me, sometimes I'll have oatmeal, and I'll take some fresh fruit, or uh, I'll take plantains that are either ripe or not ripe, and I'll make some kale with it, and that's breakfast. I like to eat different things. And what I found is when you're a vegan, 
people do expect that you're going to come up with some funky stuff, but the thing is that it's almost as if we're programmed by the marketers that we're supposed to have that toaster strudel. We're supposed to have whatever garbage they're trying to market, right. and it cracks me up because the thing is is that when I began exploring vegan foods, and especially with the vegan recipes, it was like a culinary safari. Mm-hmm. And uh, your book, I really wish I had it way back when because it would have saved me a lot of money. Well, that, that's nice to hear. Um, <laughs> well, the, the recipes, and, let me tell you, the recipes that are available on the Internet, unless it's a recipe that has been tried and true, you can waste a lot of money. You're right. I remember I did a class where I was teaching sugar cookies, and I couldn't find my recipe that I had been using for years. And sometimes you just have, you just, your mind just goes blank and you just can't remember the exact details and you, you confuse it with another recipe. So it's always helpful to have. And uh-huh. at this point, I'm a lot more organized and I have most every one of my recipes cataloged, you know, digitally. But this one particular occasion, this is a couple of years ago, I found a recipe for sugar cookies that was on a very popular cooking show website, not a network, but an actual show. I want to make that clear. And this is supposed to be somebody who's supposed to be the all-knowing expert on everything to do with cooking, baking, and everything. And the recipe was awful. Hmm. And I was completely annoyed. And then I started reading some of the comments a little bit down Mm -hmm. the recipe. And I was just like, wow, you know, might have been helpful if I took the time to really read more, more of the comments instead of just the first ten. Right. And of course, the first ten are going to be great, and then once you get into the comments, you see, oh, well, you know, why did they do this, and you don't really need to do that, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And the thing is, is that when you're making sugar cookies traditionally, it gets to be very expensive, especially mm-hmm. if you're making several dozens at once. The ingredients plus the royal mm-hmm. icing is also very expensive, and the thing is, is that I wasn't familiar with meringue powder I was doing everything the old-fashioned way from scratch. And so what I found is that I would rather, if I need a recipe, I would rather get a recipe from someone such as yourself who is tried and true Mm -hmm. and is an expert that has assembled a whole collection of authentic recipes than to try to go about it my own, especially if it's a very expensive recipe to make. And people don't think that sugar cookies are very expensive to make, but when you add it up, the cost of butter, the cost of the eggs and everything else, it does add up. And before you know it, if you're making several dozens of cookies, especially if you're looking to do a particular theme, you can spend a lot of money basically to only have something that you're going to basically toss out. Right. And that's one of the biggest problems that I find with cookbooks. So thank you for the collection that you put together because it's given me a whole new set of options. Good, good. I, I baked for a restaurant um, years ago, which is this grew out of that baking for the restaurant because ah, that's yes, why I had yes, so yes. many, um, like the Boston cream pie recipes, because I would vary them, you know, and I think, well, I could do this or I could do this because – you know, each week I'd have to, or not that I would have to, but I would try something different for the people at this. It was a, a totally vegan restaurant in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So that's where a lot of these came out of. So That's something. I mean, people still don't understand that a vegan, a, a vegan diet, if you will, and I don't really like to use the word diet, but no. just a, a plant-based entree or dessert is something that still is not very common. No. And it's unfortunate. When you go out to restaurants or if you're out and about, how do you approach the server? (laughs) Well, um, around the area in which I live, it's not um, very vegan knowledgeable, so I usually don't even use the term vegan, and I will say that I'm lactose intolerant, and um, I don't eat animal products, so I do a lot of explaining and a lot of questions and that type of thing. So I always have my radar up, and it's so exciting to me when I do go to a, a restaurant. Usually I have to drive at least an hour to get to a vegan restaurant that, where I don't have to have my radar up, and then I can just sit down and say, okay, I'm vegan, and they say, I understand. <laughs> I, give the, I give the server some money ahead of time, and I say, look, I know know. I'm going to seem like I'm difficult, but it's just I have a lot of allergies. I tip well. 
Yes, so I do. Too. I think that's very me. well so that they read the ingredients and they go back and they take care of me because they don't understand. And uh, it, it's scary eating out as a vegan. Vegetarian is not as difficult. Vegan is hard. People don't it's understand It's extremely vegan. hard. And then to top it off, not only do you have vegan dessert recipes, but you have gluten-free. Yes, I do. I have some friends who were hit with some gluten-free issues, and so I was trying to help them out and um, thought, I can do this. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's very hard to be gluten-free and vegan. You have to maintain a gluten-free vegan diet because your health demands it. That you know, that's, that's really tough, but when you're doing it because it's a choice, it is tough, but when your health demands it, you don't have a choice, and you can wind up getting very, very sick. For myself, I remember I uh, typically for Lent, one of the things that I do is I abstain from consuming any type of bread or pasta, and it's extremely difficult. But one of the things that I found was that I not only had more energy, but it really gives your health a big boost. Mm -hmm. But it's also very difficult because it's amazing how many ingredients that you can't use. Mm -hmm. You're right. It was that was difficult for me doing the gluten free, um, that especially doing the gluten free vegan, that was difficult. And I did, um, I was in contact with um, a woman, and I don't even remember her name, from Florida, who is gluten free, and it asked for a recipe. We actually worked together um, to work on a recipe for a gluten free oatmeal cookie. She said, "I really like oatmeal cookies. I miss them so much. You know, will you help me come up with a recipe?" So I do have that in here, and I said, "You know." In the little um, blurb I have at the beginning of each recipe, I said, and thank you to the Florida gluten-free vegan, <laughs> because um, <laughs> back and forth I send her, how about this one? And then she tries, she's like, well, that's close, but let's do this, and we work together on it. And um, I think it came out really, really delicious. I like it, but she helped me with that one. <laughs> because, um, you know, you have to try, when you said how many trials, it takes several trials till you get one that's like, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, and she was a taster for me. <laughs> it's, it is very difficult, and the thing is, is that there have been times when I'll make something, and there's only so many times that I really want to eat it. Mm-hmm. Whether it's something, it's because of the caloric content, mm-hmm. or the fact that I'm just sick to death of it. I mean, there there are times when I just don't want to look at kale, right. and I love kale, and I've done everything from kale chips that were dipped in dark chocolate. To, I mean, you name it, I've mm-hmm. done it. But sometimes I just have my limit. <laughs> so Kale is my favorite food in the whole entire world. That's so funny that you mentioned that. If, if People always ask, I don't know if they ask you this, but being a vegan, they'd say, so if you were stranded on a desert island, what food would you want? I don't know why they ask me this, but I've been asked several That's times. That's a really good question. And, and I think I would say, as weird as it sounds, kale. Even with my sweets, I love kale. I'm kale is, uh, when you make kale properly, because a lot of people would come up to me and say to me, well, June, how do you make kale? When my mother used to make it, it was awful. And that's because they don't know how to cook it properly. It's like with Brussels sprouts. Mm-hmm. If you make Brussels sprouts properly, the way that I make my Brussels sprouts, I cut the the, the stem off, and then mm-hmm. I just make a little X on the bottom, mm-hmm. and I put them all in a big bowl, and I, I drizzle some extra virgin olive oil, and sea salt and freshly ground black pepper, and I use my hands to coat them. Mm -hmm. And then what I do is I spread them very evenly over a baking pan, Mm -hmm. and I slow roast them. And what's interesting is is that I – and then I also – I just want to add this one little part. I add minced – freshly minced garlic. Mm -hmm. And what happens is is that in the oven they actually become very sweet. Mm -hmm. Now, I will caution anyone that that makes – Brussels sprouts, there is, of course, the subject that people don't like talking about, which is the flatulence factor, but that's mm-hmm. that's part of part these of types of some of them. But, exactly. you know, the more, the more vegetables that you eat, the less that becomes a factor. Your body gets used to it. Some people, I would love to think that, but... Uh, yeah, no, not really? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> but the thing is, okay. is that Brussels sprouts are absolutely delicious. I like and, them that way. The roasting and the slow roasting is the only way to go with them. And they're very sweet like that. Yes, they're not absolutely. bitter. I yeah. just discovered that about a year or two ago because my husband loves them, but he boils them. And, ugh. Well, he, yeah, I knew, I so knew a lot of people that. My mother used to make them, and just I didn't care for them, and he thought, ew, I don't like Brussels sprouts. Like one of the few veggies I'd say, I really don't like Brussels sprouts. And then I roasted them, and 
I like Brussels sprouts. <laughs> it's amazing when you try a new method of preparation. You're right. That it totally make it totally gives a vegetable new life. Absolutely. And I think because of the fact that many of us grew up with parents that were just basically trying to get the family fed and we're just trying to make sure that everybody had their three square meals and the meals were balanced, that unfortunately it it isn't as it is today. Many people, I know myself, it doesn't matter what I'm making, I, I happen to look at the meals as though it's something where I will take a few minutes just to sit down and enjoy whatever creation I've made because it's a few few minutes in the day that I can actually take for myself because I'm like everybody else working and burning the candle at both ends and mm-hmm. that's just how it is in today's world. One of the questions that I wanted to ask you in regards to just working with different types of foods that normally people have been a little turned off to is, for example, you list a lot of different ingredients here that I know for many people that have made the transition to a plant-based diet, they're a little unsure or squeamish about u- using certain ingredients because of the fact that, once again, the whole connotation that it's 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 expected that you're going to be eating granola and eating tofu and, you know, it's going to be a very boring diet. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that you used, for example, carob. Mm-hmm. Carob was one thing that I kind of kept away from also only because of the fact that when I was a kid, and my mother would buy anything that had carob in it, I don't know, you just, you make this association because of what society teaches you, and then as an adult, when you make the transition, it just takes on a whole new meaning. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right with that. I had a connotation also of it because the way people refer to it it is as the fake chocolate. (laughs) Exactly, yeah, 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 that's very true. And I don't think, I try not to think of it as the the chocolate substitute is just another flavor. You think of it in its own right, and it's really very delicious in its own right. Does it taste like chocolate? No, it's different. But it's delicious in its own right. So that's why I put it in there. This is a carob shake. If you, you know, can drink chocolate or eat chocolate, you know, you can have your chocolate if you want, or you can have your carob. I happen to be able to, you know, eat both of them. But um, I like carob for, um, it's almost like a, a malted flavor in there as well. So I think it's very delicious in its own right. But it and, did get that negative connotation. Yeah, and I think your description is really quite accurate. It's it's a flavor. Mm-hmm. It's not something that should be avoided because of maybe a, a previous association, but it's it's simply a flavor that you can utilize very easily. And on that note, your utilization of coconut oil, that's mm-hmm. something that many people have this preconceived notion that coconut oil is going to taste, it's going to automatically make any dish that you prepare taste like a pina colada. Mm -hmm. Um, That's very interesting also. I did quite a bit of research on coconut oil, and I found it to be an oil that um, works very well with baking, and I was surprised, too. It does not um, make anything taste like coconut, uh, which I I was surprised at. But the, the research is very interesting that it's a, thermogenetic oil and that it's extremely healthy, even though it is a saturated fat, which we're told to stay away from, but that it's the one healthy saturated fat just because of the way it's made up and it got very much into chemistry in some of the the sites that I would go into and and research it. So I think that's something to keep an eye on in the future as I do some more research that um, I think there's an interesting debate going on with coconut oil. I found that the coconut provides a myriad of products that are absolutely wonderful and one product of which is coconut milk. Mm -hmm. I remember just going into different chat rooms and asking vegans what they use as a coffee creamer or milk substitute when it comes to coffee and I got a mixture of responses. Some people would say, oh, you can't drink coffee. Coffee is so bad for you, blah, 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 blah. Uh, You know something? There are certain things that I absolutely will not do, but coffee is something that I enjoy. I grew up with parents that were old world, Europe style, (laughs) whatever you want to call it, and it's one of the things that I truly do enjoy, and it's more of a social thing. But I enjoy the flavor of coffee, and I only drink certified organic shade-grown coffee. The flavor is just wonderful, and it's something that I just don't want to give up. I don't drink it by the pot. 
I, you know, I, I, with everything else, you know, within reason. But Mm -hmm. the thing is, is that I was looking for a creamer, and I was surprised how many people use coconut milk as creamer. Mm Mm-hmm. I think it has that, even though it's very thin, it has that rich flavor to it, and I think that's another excellent substitute for a vegan milk. When I talk about different vegan milks that you try, the one that, that you like the best, and I think that's another um, excellent source. But um, I have some friends who also can't tolerate dairy milk. There's lots of people out there that can't tolerate dairy. It's, it's amazing. And um, they've gone to coconut milk for a coffee creamer. So I think that's a good substitute. I'm with you on not giving up the coffee, but I happen to drink it black. <laughs> So I, uh, I don't need the creamer part in there. My stomach <laughs> just can't tolerate the, the strength of black coffee. Yeah. I tried when I was in Italy, I, and you know, the coffee's superb over there, but I just couldn't. It was just mm-hmm. way too strong for me. Some people have different preferences, and that's right. okay. And it's, that's a matter of, it's a matter of choice, you know. But one of the things that I also discovered was working with things like coconut flour, even plantain flour. Mm-hmm. I actually spent a little bit of time when I gave up gluten-free foods for Lent. Mm -hmm. I started exploring some of the options out there. And one of them was rice flour, Mm -hmm. which is not that, I mean, it's not terribly complicated to work with. It's just you have to look at the ingredients as far as what the properties are and what you can actually use them for. And I think that's one of the biggest tricks to making any vegan recipe is understanding what foods you need to substitute and what foods basically have the same texture or consistency so that it's an even exchange. That's correct. And that is one issue, though, when you're substituting different flours. They're fun to play around with, but they will definitely change the recipe in it. You really have to experiment and not and expect that you're going to have some successes and some failures because the properties are so different. But it is a lot of fun. There's so many different flowers coming out all the time. I've been starting to experiment with um, almond flour. I'm sure that's been out for a while, but I'm just now starting to use that myself. And I made just a um, a delicious banana bread. It, it was just almond flour, bananas, um, honey. Um, it was for a friend of mine, so um, I did put the honey in it and. Um, an egg substitute and just awesome with the egg substitutes one of the issues that i have is the egg substitutes scare me and i won't use them what Mm -hmm. i do typically use if if a recipe calls for eggs what i usually will do is i'll use applesauce what are the suggestions do you have for people such as myself that are just too squeamish to use the artificial stuff i i don't care what how what they say about it it just it's Mm -hmm. a little too squeamish for me the the one that I use most commonly when I bake for myself is just flax flour. I make a slurry out of flax flour. Um, mm-hmm. So it's the, the ground up flax seeds, and then you just add, uh, for every teaspoon of flax seeds, you add a quarter cup of water and just stir that around and let it sit for about five minutes and put it in, and there's your egg or your egg substitute. So that's what I use. Um, now, in my cookbook, I do say you can use the Energy Egg Replacer. Um, that ha- It's it's basically based on potato starch and that type of um, ingredients, flours and things like that. Um, so you can use that as well. But if I'm making things for myself, I usually use the flax flour. Flax Thank you. Meal. Now, what is your advice when people are making their own milk, such as almond milk or hemp milk, anything like that? Do you have any particular tricks that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, I have not made my own vegan milk. I have to admit, I, I always buy the prepared, so I'm not... It's cheaper, I think, to make your own. I, I th- Well, no, I think it's cheaper to buy oh, it, personally. Oh, yeah, it might be. I just, yeah, I haven't... I mean, you can control you can control the quality a lot better if right. you make it yourself, but the thing is is that when you look at the cost of a pound of organic almonds and you try to make right. al- uh, organic almond milk, it's, it's a little cheaper cost to just... prohibitive. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's one area where I tend to say, you know, something I think I'm going to buy it. But, you know, it depends upon what the occasion is. If it's something in which I already have all the ingredients that I've either grown myself or I have a very big supply of a particular ingredient, then, of course, I'm going to go to town. But the thing is, is that some ingredients, especially when it comes to nuts, 
-hmm. They're very, very expensive, so I tend to prefer to buy a trusted brand as opposed to just making it myself. And you know, that's a little unusual for somebody such as myself because I'm, I'm just very particular about what ingredients I do use mm -hmm. and the quality and the source of those ingredients. Because I found that there are a lot of products that are on the market where they may say that they're vegan, but they're not necessarily certified organic. And even if they are certified organic, they are not necessarily GMO-free. So right. it puts you in this conundrum where, okay, well, if I want to make this recipe, what do I, what do? I do? Mm -hmm. And for the most part, what I've been doing is just opting not to make anything. I just make something else. Right. And the thing is, is that it's a shame because there's certain types of desserts and other recipes that I would love to make, but mm -hmm. it's a lack of available ingredients that are Certified. suited to my needs. Right, and I think that is a problem. And making it yourself is one way to do that, depending how much time you have and how much um, cost you're willing to do for it. Um, so that's, you know, that's an option, but that's tricky. Hopefully, as time goes on, um, certified organic products will become easier and easier to get hold of, and then that won't be as much of an issue because I know from the first time that I wrote the first edition of this book to now, and, you know, and that's a space of almost 10 years, I think, um, there's been a lot of new products coming on the market, so it's getting a little easier. It is, but a little still, bit. It's still your own is always a long better. way to go. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> especially when it comes to the gluten-free products. Uh, so that has a long way to go. That's just now coming onto the market. But it takes people like yourself. It's nice what you're doing here with this um, radio station to get people to think about it, and become more aware of it. Well, it's so nice what you're doing because you put the recipes basically in our hands so that we are not stuck eating something that tastes awful. I can't tell you how many times. I've been to a tasting or a show where somebody will say, oh, try this, it's gluten-free and it's organic and blah, blah, blah. And I look at them and tell them, little teeny tiny I say, take a small piece. <laughs> very, very, very tiny, tiny, you know, taste that's suitable for a mouse. Okay. And for the most part, usually that little bit of, bit of a taste will determine, okay, is this something that I want to politely smile, walk away, sit it in my <laughs> napkin, or if I say, oh, yeah, that's really that's really wonderful, mm -hmm. and continue with the sample. It's just a very polite way of going about it. There's just so many gluten products, gluten-free products, rather, that are on the market that there, there, are, there are some that are coming out that are wonderful, but the majority are still, you know. They have a so way folks, to go. Exactly. So, yeah. folks, when you have that situation happen, what you need to do is pick up a copy of Sinfully Vegan and think of Lois and think of all the, the hours and hours and hours that she spent in the bake shop, in the bakery rather, making all these recipes just so that you don't have to spend a fortune trying to figure out how to make them yourself. And that's, that's my advice. But um, uh, another question that I have for you, Lois, is what is your favorite sweetener to work with and why? Oh, let's see, my favorite sweetener. Um, I mean, some people prefer to use organic cane sugar. Some people use honey. Some people use agave. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. Right. Um, I would say uh, it depends what I'm making, but I, the supernaut, which is the, the natural cane sugar, I like if I'm making a more mainstream recipe. If it's something that I call a little, you know, a little more... Um, uh, organic or, or I don't know what the word is that I want, but then I'll use the agave. Um, mm -hmm. That's become a lot more available and a little less expensive, so I'll use that. Um, so those are probably the two that are my favorite when I'm making something that I'm eating. Now, I use maple syrup in some a lot of the recipes because um, that's more readily available, I think, than agave, um, or at least it, it used to be. But I think I would go for the agave more. Yeah, agave, there are different issues with it. I happen to like agave. Uh, I'm not crazy about the flavored agaves. Just to smell them is a little, it, it, yeah. it doesn't really resonate with me. But the, the dark amber agave is something that I find to be very easy to work with. And it's water-soluble, so you mm -hmm. can use it in all sorts of recipes. When it comes to baking, Especially if I'm making some type of bread, I tend to use honey basically because of the fact that it's 
it gives it a different flavor and it seems to be a great accelerator. There, of course, honey is a very controversial subject with the vegan community, and that's another show altogether. But correct. Uh, and I stayed away from honey in the book only because of that. But yes, I do. I I use honey, you know, when I'm baking for myself too. <laughs> well, one of the things that I remind people, especially that have voiced their opinions about bees, beekeepers, and and honey, is that fact that we're dealing with colony collapse disorder, and if we don't do something to help the bees, we're going to lose them. So without them, we're not going to be eating anything. Absolutely. I I have read some scary articles that we better help the bees and, you know, keep them around because of what would happen if we don't. So that's I think that's an interesting issue. Well, when people listen to the shows that I've done and they take a look at all the different interviews that I've done, and I think I have covered more more uh, experts on beekeeping and especially some of the top university professors that have been on the show, I'm, I'm really trying to make a concerted effort. So when I have people that make comments, you know, a lot of the rumors that are, or a lot of the things that are put out in the rumor mill, maybe at one, maybe at one point people might have done certain things, but that's not the case anymore. I think in any industry, any area of agriculture, there were things that were done that shouldn't have been done, and that's why, you know, we're trying to strive to do better. Mm-hmm. But um, in any event, uh, getting back to ingredients, one of the things that I thought was very interesting about your recipes is that uh, you tend to use a lot of fruit. What do you recommend if, say, for example, if it's off season, do you think that if you use a frozen fruit, it's just as good as the fresh, or does it really matter, especially if you're baking something or if you're making some type of frozen dessert? Um, depends on what the dessert is, but most of the time I would say that a frozen fruit would work well. Um, it, it does depend on the fruit. Like strawberries, no, I, wouldn't, I would not say. They, they do not freeze as well, and they come out, the color is not as nice and that type of thing. But cherries, yes, blueberries. You know, that works. So it does depend on the fruit. Um, bananas, you can freeze those. If you want to make the banana bread, they come out looking really not gross. <laughs> um, but they, they're wonderful. They're sweet and they're great, It's um, so it works well also. So um, that's usually something that's really good to do if you, you know think ahead when it's in season because I'm a big believer of buying fruit that's in season, so you're getting local fruit, the local organic fruit, and then freezing it, and then you can... Um, have something out of season. Otherwise, what I tend to do is just make things when the fruit's in season. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are starting to go back to that. People are finding that uh, even from an emotional perspective, and there's some research being done about this very subject, where people are opting to buy locally grown in-season organic fruit and other produce and they buy what's in season because they allow the body to to have a break from that particular type of produce as opposed to just having it 24/7 you know every single day of the year and there's a big resurgence going on as well in Europe where people I mean this is tradition for them but with us it's something that we're starting to incorporate back into our food choices, and I think that's very important, especially when you're trying to do the right things or, uh, as far as making your own contribution by voting with your dollars, so to speak, and it, it really does make a difference. I know that if I have watermelon in the winter, by the time summer rolls around, I don't want to look at it. Mm-hmm. And, and I think yeah, and, and a good the, point. The thing is is that there's nothing like summer fruit during the summer. When you have summer fruit during the winter, it doesn't, for some reason, it just never tastes right, And especially if it's being imported regardless whatever farm it's grown on, this and that. It just has never tasted right to me. And the thing is is that I'm just at a point now where I only buy organically grown fruit that is local and it's in season because I just think from an emotional perspective, it's better for the body. Right, and I think that's a good point. Um, I mean, here I can only get strawberries right around this time of year. They're just about done, so I wouldn't even think of making one of my strawberry cakes in the winter. I I can't do it. I would not do it. So Mm. I think that's a good point, and I think people are moving towards that, and I think that's a good thing. 
with the holiday season, what is your favorite recipe to make that you you bring to friends, family, what have you, that's always something that goes over well with everybody? Well, it's it's not one of my showy ones. It's one of the the down home recipes and it's um in here it's called your grandma's crumb cake um because it was one of the recipes that was handed down through my family. It was um I had to really work to get it even to, into any kind of recipe because it was one of those where it said, you know, one coffee cup of this and one black spoon of this, and I have no idea what those things look like. Yeah, and that's, never that's, kitchen made it exactly. up. Exactly. That's very true of the old recipes. <laughs> right. and there are so many books that I actually have that are circa 1950, 1940. You know, I mean, some of these books are really very old, but it's interesting when you look at the recipes and – they have, oh, a handful of this or a cup of that, and you're just like, or they use terms that just don't even exist. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's one of those kind of the real good recipes that come from way back, but that's what the, it was, and then I veganized it, and it's just a light crumb cake, and then I play around with it. I might put blueberries in the middle or mix peaches into the batter or whatever I want to do, or I put um, whatever fruits in season or some that I've frozen. You know, I have lots of blueberries. I, I freeze those like crazy. I just, you know, cook them with a little bit of water till they break down, you know, almost like a, a jam kind of thing, and then mm. just freeze them just like that. And, and then I can put them in, in the, between this cake, and it's always a hit, and it's just it's so easy, and people don't believe that it's vegan. That's one of those things earlier when you had asked, do I tell people before I give them something or after, and I tell them after <laughs> because I so often have gotten the comment, well, I could never be vegan because I like my food to taste good. Did you ever get that? <laughs> I get that all the time, and then I know, when people, <laughs> people have dinner with me, they're surprised, or if right. I, I send them pictures with the recipe, they're just like, wow, that looks really good. Right. They're, they're just shocked. So I tell them after so they don't get that preconceived notion. And they look at me like, really? No, you're kidding. Really? You know, so I tell them after. And, and so I take that when I have school functions or something like that. And, and that's always a, a real tried and true that people always like. And I don't know if you have a copy of the, the newly released Simply Vegan, but it's it's actually a photograph on the back, the, the crumb cake on the back. So that's the one that I would always take. Um, ah, yes. Actually, I do have the new the new version and right. yeah that looks really good back. and you know just speaking of those pictures i have to point out that the picture that's on the left there of the the ice cream it's um that is my absolute probably favorite recipe in the whole book it's um a chocolate cherry banana ice cream and what it is it's really just mushed up fruit salad it's frozen bananas frozen cherries and then you throw in some cocoa and a little bit of water and you just whiz it up in the food processor and it comes out like soft serve ice cream you can eat that every single night and not feel guilty. It's so that's good. The, exactly. And that's one of the things about vegan desserts, for the most part, unless you have gobs of sugar in it, and for the most part, any vegan ice cream that you're going to eat is by far going to have less right. less of the usual stuff that usually makes you think, oh, I really shouldn't have had that. Correct. Now I'm going to have to spend an extra hour at the gym tomorrow <laughs> and that. And it's the same thing with vegan entrees for the most part. I mean, unless it's something that's deep fried or has a lot of a lot of really high calorie foods in it, for the most part, you can eat, you can eat it and feel good about it and not think, wow, you know, I really overdid it. Especially what happens during the holiday season. I know for Thanksgiving, I used to teach a class called Gobble to You Wobble, and literally the, the recipes that I taught were suited for pretty much anybody that wanted to be able to bring something that they would enjoy because whenever you're going to someone else's house, you're subjected to their cooking. And you don't want to be rude. You don't want to be the person who doesn't want to eat anything because, you know, you're difficult. Right which I've been told many times. Yeah, but so have I. I think any <laughs> vegan has. <laughs> You're so picky. Yeah. I well, that's why I pretty <laughs> much will make something. I usually make a couple of things because I know at least if I eat what I brought, I won't be offending anybody because they'll say, oh, you know, I really just love this and it's my favorite thing and that they usually kind of ignore it. Or I'll say, oh, yeah, I tried it. It was great. But, you know, but it, it does tend to be very tricky. And the thing that I like also about your recipes is that they're very simple and, once again, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Even your ice creams, they're called ice creams, but in essence, it's basically a combination of different fruits. Right. They're really just fruit salads. 
that they look like ice cream, and they're my favorite. You know, I'm a chocolate eater. I say that all over in the book, so that's why the chocolate cherry is my favorite. But the pineapple coconut's delicious. We even tried that. We put a little bit of drizzled some rum down on it. So that was pretty good too. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, is that once again, the desserts that you feature in this book are not necessarily something that would be really high calorie, high fat, high this, high that. It's something that you can consume and not feel guilty about, and that's why the title, Sinfully Vegan, Correct. it's kind of ironic because there's nothing sinful about any of the recipes. The recipes are really just wonderfully thought out, very well put together, very easy to make, very friendly for your budget, friendly for your kids. Quick question for you. When it comes to freezing desserts or preparing your desserts ahead of time, given the fact that you're using the freshest ingredients, what do you recommend, like, say, if some of these recipes I wanted to make them ahead of time, say, for Thanksgiving or some of the upcoming holidays? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the recipes freeze very well, especially if you make them in parts. Like, if you're making a cake, make the cake ahead of time, freeze it, and then all you have to do is thaw it out, make the icing, and, and uh, you're ready to go or... Um, it just really depends on what the recipe is, but a lot of them can be made ahead of time. The fruit ice creams, those you pretty much have to make though right when you're going to eat them. I, I wouldn't recommend making those and trying to freeze it and then scoop it because they're like a sorbet. They get really, they would get very hard. Well, that and plus the molecular structure of the ice, right? That it changes it, the yeah. consistency. Absolutely. Every time that you take it out and then put it back in, the ice yep. crystals that form. It kind of alters it, and some people might find that to be unappealing. But the thing is is that you can usually make them fresh, and that's something that I like to do, especially during the summer months where it's very hot. And the thing is is that, once again, you can make these, and kids, if you if you make them for your family, don't mm-hmm. tell your kids until afterwards. Exactly. And I did try to – I made a section that was for the kids and the young at heart because they were targeted um, – for kids to try to draw your kids into the healthier recipes like the um, the fruity pizza. You know, it's a sugar cookie rolled out like a pizza dough, and it has lots of fruits and things on it. And so it it was um, kid-friendly or um, fruit, a fruit cup in a, an ice cream cone, that kind of thing. So it's kid-friendly and gets them to, the kids to think, wow, these are good. Or the fruit pops, that's another one of my favorite, pureed fruit with a, some tofu cream swirled through it, and they freeze it. I love those in the summer in this heat wave. <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting because there are fruit pops that are on the market that you can buy, and they're not cheap. Right. I think it's cheaper to just pick up a copy of Sinfully Vegan, make your own, and just keep making your own because, especially in this economy, people are really starting to pay attention to what they buy, and they want that dollar to really stretch. And whether they're located in the United States or outside Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, South America, doesn't matter, Canada. People want their money to stretch out as much as possible. And the, the bottom line is is that if you're on a very tight budget, the only way that you can really go is to make your own food. And uh, when you have a lot of concern about the quality of your ingredients, and especially if you can grow many of the things that you need on your own, that's a, a great way to save a lot of money. So from an economic standpoint, it's always better to make your own. Plus, it always tastes better. Just, nobody's going to go through the trouble that you will go through for yourself or for your family. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a salad or if you're making ice pops. It's the love, the effort, and just the care that goes into the preparation of that recipe. And I think the the proof is the finished product, how it tastes. Absolutely, and I'm not aware of any commercial organic fruit pops. Are there? Do they sell them? I can't say that I've actually scoured the market for them, but I'm not aware. They don't. It doesn't jump out at me. So this way, by making them, you can control that for your children. Because I know um, my children are all grown now, but if they were young, I would not be feeding them anything but organic. Yeah, there are a couple of companies out there that have different types of frozen desserts. It it escapes me as far as the names, but they're out there. It's just, once again, like you, if I'm going to make a frozen dessert, I'm going to make it myself from scratch Mm -hmm. because if you're going to indulge in something, do it right. Right, exactly. Do it right, enjoy it, embrace it, celebrate. Hey, light candles when you do it. 
And Absolutely. <laughs> sit down, take the time to enjoy it. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it, once again, when you're making things yourself and you're controlling the ingredients that you put into something, uh, any recipe, doesn't matter what it is, there's always, it's always going to taste better. And the thing is, is that it's something that's all, also a conversation piece, especially with your guests and with friends, family, what have you. And there's also a sense of pride. And I think the more people that decide that they're going to use, you know, very well-written cookbooks such as Simply Vegan, people are going to be very pleased with the results. Mm-hmm. I know? think by taking things out when you go places, the, the good quality or organic vegan recipes, that it opens the door to conversation. People are open to talking about it. They're interested. Oh, of course. Lois, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been wonderful learning about everything that inspired you to write Sinfully Vegan and also has been a great opportunity for people to understand that there are so many wonderful foods out there that are plant-based and the recipes that you've created are just so incredibly easy to make and not very expensive for that matter. Folks, we are out of time, but thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.